Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, welcome back to our faculty development workshops organized by Lumina College and Faith and Science Collaborative Research of Hong Kong U. This is our third section now. So far we have completed two sections, one in December last year on consumerism and growth and the other one is uh, in January this year on disruption of technology. Before we kick off this section three, I shall ask Dr. Leung Wing Tai to present souvenirs to our two speakers today before we forgot. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Leung, please. Uh, the first one is to Professor Ho Kin Chung. <coughs> Thank you. Yes. The second. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, the uh, the book we have from Lumina College. Uh, we purpose we have a conference last year in January, and we published it in November this year. <laughs> Uh, last year, <laughs> so it was a, 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 a really great book. <coughs> and the topic is Christian Mind in the Emerging World. It's about faith integration in Asian consciousness and group perspective. So it's a very exciting book. I, I'm sure you would enjoy reading it. <laughs> yes, thank you. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, second one, uh, Dr. Mac Chen Wan Ning. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, this is, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should we take the two together or? Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. You found a, a, a mic? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, before we start the lectures today, may I also ask Dr. Leung Wing Tai to give a brief recap summary of our last session and the discussion and assignments and homework uh, we have received so far from our last session. Wing Tai, peace. Uh, last time we have some homework done by some of our outstanding members <laughs> and it was on disruptive technology and we asked them name some disruptive technology and how would it impact on us okay and one of the uh, suggestion was AI artificial intelligence is going to replace some intelligent workers as it was for some labor workers in the past so AI is going to replace professors, <laughs> doctors, <laughs> lawyers, <laughs> and, and <laughs> whoever think themselves knowledge workers. Okay? And then the, um, and the, uh, and the reflection is from Iris, one of our participants. She mentioned that we humans create something called AI. We try to help us solve problems, but at the same time, it creates new problems. <laughs> such as job and so, so every technology has the good side and the bad side and uh, it's a trading off that's what she suggested my response is that technology uh, can be disruptive because of the uh, nature of technology it will change the culture shape us change the power structure and the business and uh, you, you, you look at the, the history of emerging technology uh, human tends to find uh, new technology, new tools to replace old methods. Meaning, for example, in the camera, in the old days we paint, right? we paint royal celebrities, and then we have the camera, now we don't have to paint difficulty. You know, we, we just take a shot. 
So usually we take the new technology to doing old things better and well. And after a long while, then they start to think about the technology doing new things that is beyond the old habits, you see. So my suggestion is that AI is not going to uh, intended to replace human labor. It's not going to intend and save costs, but to create something new that we cannot do in the past and also extend our human uh, contribution because of the support of AI in that matter. And also, technology can be extra-human, uh, enrich human instead of non-human and dehuman. <laughs> That's my response. And secondly, from Ivan, Ivan mentioned about social power distribution as the new disruptive technology, meaning uh, social media, digital, you know, social power distribution. Uh, the, the, Z, the Z generation, uh, depending on you are American or, or British, <laughs> truly believes in social power distribution, digital marketing, experiential learning, and uh, blended and flip-flopped classrooms and small group discussions and so on. All right? And they are very critical of the state status quo and because they tend to participate and then they join together. And in the Irvin's uh, presentation last time in entrepreneurship, is greatly exemplified this kind of new trends, uh, participation in small groups. My critique is that uh, we tend to be too optimistic about the democratization of new technology. <laughs> it could be another way of centralization. Some people say in the future there will, there, there will be only five universities. You know, Google, Apple. <laughs> Apple. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. So the centralization comes into a different way. Because when you walk into a supermarket, AI, you know, the, 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 the security camera will identify you. As a matter of fact, Zheng Hock Yao's uh, concerts, uh, we got a lot of uh, uh, really minor uh, uh, thieves arrested. <laughs> Uh, so, so the big brother is with, with you, you know, H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, 1984, right? So, uh, 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 George Orwell, George Orwell, yes. <laughs> anyway, the idea is that don't think that we decentralize as much as you thought, but we tend to be centralized at the same time. So that is, but the good thing about uh, ambiguity, I think it's good, because uh, uh, Newbingen, as quoted by Ivan, uh, the myth of certainty. We tend to control, predict, uh, certain, and then ambiguity, paradoxical, fuzzy logic, and uh, big data, you know, uh, 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 approximation, and all this uh, handle uncertainty will be the norm in the future. And that is something that is good. So my two cents, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Wing Tai, for your report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I have great pleasure of introducing to you our first speaker today. Uh, Professor Hawking Jung is the founding director of the Research Institute of Hong Kong, the former dean of science and technology at Open University of Hong Kong. Professor Ho's academic interests include marine ecology, water quality, environmental policies, environmental ethics, and environmental education. Besides his work at Open University, Professor Ho is also a council member of the Hong Kong Climate Change Forum and the Green Council. Uh, he is honorary president of Green Power and president of the Macau Green Environmental Protection Association. So a lot of things he has been doing. He must have a lot of things to share with us on this topic, go beyond zero impact, environmental stewardship, and corporate environmental responsibility against climate changes. So we welcome Professor Ho Kin Chung, please. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you, Wing Thai and uh, other colleagues of Lunar College uh, for giving me this chance uh, to talk to you this morning. And uh, you might have given me you know, this, if the, this big topic, you know, go beyond zero impact, you know, and you know, environmental stewardship and corporate so so and environmental responsibility against climate change. I can make this lecture in three hours or more, <laughs> but you know, today I must you know, concentrate it into you know, only 15 minutes. So first of all, I think uh, I talk about my guest today. And uh, the first time you know, Wing Tai met me this morning, he said that you, you are in summer cold. <laughs> Although you know, it is the summertime of Antarctic, and, but you know, in Hong Kong it's still in winter, right? But unfortunately, you know, we allow you know, of that uh, very warm climate today. You know, when and wet, just like a spring you know, in the south, southern part of China. And I think you know, global climate change, I don't need to say more. And you know, it is a threat or you know, more, uh, more people would like to say it is an undeniable threat. So you know, I have been Antarctic. You know, for four times, and but you know, I have been the Arctic for 15 times. Yeah, I'm going to be my turn this trip, you know, for the whole region in the coming April. So, so I think you know, nobody here, you know, better than me, you know, to describe what happened, you know, about climate change in the polar region. You know, in fact, you know, for example, you know, my research station, which is you know, located in the Lofton Norwegian Arctic and you know around 20 years ago you know, outside my window I'm able to see you know, more than three glaciers but now it reduced to only two <laughs> and in fact according to surveys you know, by a, a lot of scientists you know, who do monitoring on the on the length of the glacier you know, they find that you know, during the past 20 years you know, the fun line of the glacier have been deduced you know, for more than 60 meters. You know, imagine you know, that glacier is so high, you know, as high as this building of your big food center. You, know, when, you, know, you can see the volume of water you know, when it melts and you know, dissolves into the water of the sea. And you know, it is undeniable stretch. I, I don't need to say more, but just show you some picture. There, these are some of the broken eyes. And you know, they are the graves I can see now. <laughs> in the past, you know, there were three you know, graves, but now it's only two. <laughs> so, go back you know, to the main cause of global climate change. You know. What do you think? You know, in your mind, you know, it, we always in my life, you know, that's global climate change. So, have you ever think you know, deeply about? So the cause of global climate change. What's in your mind? <laughs> yes. Why? But why? <laughs> I'm a scientist, so I, I, I would like to ask questions. You know. It's getting warm, it's getting hot. You know. Why is it getting hot? Some you know, related to our energy consumption, right? Yeah, because you know, during the past few hundred years, you know, we burn a lot of fossil fuel you know, including coal and oil, you know, that emits a lot of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases you know, into the sky and that make the world so-called uh, greenhouse effect. You know. Yes, that's one of the reasons. But a lot, personally, I think it is not the fundamental. I think the fundamental is population growth. <laughs> Don't you believe it? Just look at this curve. So it's a curve about human population you know, during the past 10,000 years. And you know, in fact, you know, for more of the 9,000 years, you know, we have only limited amount of human population in the world, according to the archaeology studies. But you know, in fact, you know, the major goal of human population was during the past 100 years. You know, just imagine, you know, in 19 zero, you know, in 19 zero, and uh, what was the overall po world population? That's only 
one point four billion, <laughs> as big as the human population in China nowadays. But during one hundred years, you, you see, during one hundred years, you know, the human population increased five times. <laughs> so, especially you, know, I can say, it it is uh, too much, and uh, in fact, you, know, the five times increase in human population actually was not in the past 100 years. It was in the past 60 years, mainly after the Second World War. <laughs> so, what do you think? You know, I enjoy you know, the river of Singmun. You know, Singmun River, I like the sense of Singmun River. You know, in 1950, you know, I swim there. But now you, know, you can't never you know, swim in Singmun River. <laughs> it can't, uh, you know, it will kill you, you know, not because of the water, because of the water quality, <laughs> right? So, during my child's time, you know, the overall population in Satin is only 100,000. <laughs> but nowadays, it is you know, 2.5 million, you know, in the catchment of Toro Harbor. So, you know, So, and the other fact is we call it technology deficiency. What's technology deficiency? So, I, although I don't like the term destructive technology, but it is really destructive, <laughs> right? I would like to say AI is a constructive technology rather than destructive. But you know, in fact, it is more destructive than constructive. Nowadays, in fact, according to statistics, during the past 300 years, you know, some people tell us, you know, 95 percent of how natural resources and how human resources are consumed in developing the world, making use of the natural resources, and make it you know to change our life, to make our life more comfortable, so we call. And but you know, only five percent of the natural resources will consume you know, for the sake of recycling natural products, for the sake of reuse and environmental activities. So you know, this is a so-called imbalance you know, in, in technology use, right? You know, nowadays, you know, we always think of how to mix you of the natural resources. When you will ever think about you know, what happened after you use the natural resource and you know, invent 95% of our resources nowadays is consumed you know, and export you know, from the natural earth you know, rather than you know, only 5% we make sure of them in environmental protection. So, one, too many people. <laughs> Second, you know, too many technology and too many natural resources being consumed with only limited amount of them being used. And more problematic, I think, is about poverty. In fact, you know, while you know, they, uh, if I do not remember wrong, there's about uh, 7.8 billion people of human population in the earth. But unfortunately, you know, 80 percent of people consume. 20% of people consume 80% of the natural resources nowadays. And the other 80% people suffer from environmental deterioration. So, you know, more of the wealthy countries, you know, like United States, Canada, and nowadays, you know, the coastal area of mainland China, you know, we consume a lot of natural resources. You know, 20% of people consume 80% of natural resource. That's the problem of poverty. So who will be the most affected you know, if there is climate change? Have you ever considered? Have you ever considered who will be first affected by global climate change? Not us, but the people who are poor, but the people who live in the developing countries. You know, you see, Hong Kong, you know, we have 
very short winter. We have long spring and summer. So what? Yo, we have air conditioning, <laughs> right? <laughs> we have money and we can pay to CLP, you know, so that you know, we can always fit on you know, our air conditioning. And so if we can have it, so the assumption is that if we are able to make money, you know, we are able to consume natural resources, right? <laughs> but you know, in the developing country, can they? So what's the outcome of global climate change? More storm, more typhoon, more flooding. Who will be more affected? Not us, but the poor people. But the people in developing country, you know, like those in India, in Pakistan, you know, in the Middle East. So they are more affected than us. 80% of natural resources are consumed by the wealthy people. But you know, we are not actually the most suffered. You know, the poor, you know, they are the most suffered. That's, you know, when we talk about sustainability, you know, so we not only talk about how we are able to make use of the natural resource. Sustainability include what? Include equity. Equity, right? 80% of natural resources was consumed by 20% of wealthy people. That's an imbalance. We have to be equal you know, to the poor, and we have also be responsible to our next generations. You know, nowadays, you know, we are something you know, like making use of a credit card. You know, we use our credit of natural resource. So, you know, the natural resources we use nowadays is not inherited you know, from, our, from our ancestors. We are making use of our natural resources of our future generation, right? <laughs> That's the problem. So, you know, when talking about natural resource and environmental population, you know, we always talk about two key, you know, two key sentences you know, about one is carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the maximum load that the population can afford to support our system, right? That's carrying the capacity. And the other is assimilative capacity. <coughs> Assimilation capacity means, you know, when we consume you know, the natural resource, you know, how we are able to make it digested and be sorted and resumed. But Unfortunately, you know, nowadays, our carrying capacity is over. <laughs> Lighter, you know, our simulated capacity also over. So we are making use of our, the natural resources of our future generation, like we are making use of a credit card, over credit. So what should we do again I am meant to deterioration and global climate change? So we always ask this question, but uh, you know, regrettably saying, I would say that you know, we have no way to change the trend. We have no way to change the trend. You can't you know, reduce the human population to 100 years ago. And more problematic is you know, people would like to consume more and more natural resources to, to improve the living quality. That's an example in mainland China. In mainland China, actually, nowadays, there are two problems. One, you know, too many people still. The other, you know, too many people want to make their living quality improve. So they consume a lot of natural resources. So unfortunately, you know, we look at global climate change, but you know, we can't do anything. Even though the Paris Convention you know, we signed you know, two, two to three years ago, you know, what was the outcome of Paris Con Convention? Chose. <laughs> Chose. You know, nobody can make a decision. Nobody would like to commit. <laughs> nobody to take it serious. Because you know, we look at the living quality of nowadays. So we never think about our future generation. And unfortunately, even though you know, we think about that, you know, to be honest, you know, 
you still need to make a living call the good. And that consumes resource. So you know, what should we do? I can see only this reduction, right? <laughs> Remediation, remedy, resilient, to reduce, to against, to do some engineering work, early warming, forecasting. You know, nowadays, unfortunately, more of our work is still only focused on early warming. Only limited amount of our effort have put into reduction, resilience, and the remedy. You know, in future, not only early warming, we need to forecast. Forecast, you know, need a lot of scientific research. You know, big data you know, is you know, very important, you know, I can say. But you know, in fact, that's all problem of control and management. Risk and contingency plan, we need that. Remediation, remediation means uh, to reduce, uh, to when there is something really harmful, we reduce the harm. And so we do something, you know, when, when there is a fudge, and so you, know, you build higher, you know, the dam, <laughs> so that you know, it will not fudge, you know, for engineer. For resilient, you know, should be more proactive. For example, you know, we're making use of new technology. You know, uh, like the renewable energy, and that so that you know we can replace the, the global uh, climate change by reducing the uh, global greenhouse gas emission. That's uh, that's more engineering and more technology oriented. But you know, remediation means something. You know, just re to reduce the harm, or to you know, to 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 make the harm you know, more. More beneficial, <laughs> maybe something. Yeah, uh, but there's uh, a risk. Uh, we never think about it is a risk, but it in, in fact it is a risk. And uh, contingency, you know, you know, it it is something you are unexpected. We do some early work. So overall, it is control and management. So wh what's the meaning of conservation nowadays? Have you ever considered? <laughs> you know, a lot of people say you know, they are environmental. Uh, protection, they are environmentalists. They want to conserve the natural system. In fact, uh, we cannot control it. We preserve it. We cannot preserve it. We can conserve it. Conserve means management. <laughs> we cannot preserve the natural system, right? Like the shoreline of Victoria Harbour. You know, 100 years ago, you know, the shoreline of Victoria Harbour is in Queen's Road. <laughs> Right? Uh, now, you know, we, we came to see to make more land use. So without reclamation for Hong Kong Island, we do not have the economic uh, standard of Hong Kong nowadays. So you know, we cannot preserve the shoreline of Hong Kong, but we can conserve it. Conserve means management. So it is fundamental concept. <laughs> but a lot of people haven't think about that. So nowadays, you know, everybody say it is you know, sustainable development. It is important. So what's the meaning of sustainability to you? What's the meaning of sustainable de development to you? So in the past, so we can say that you know, there's three kinds of developments in the world. So one is the social development, the other is economic development, and you know, Recently, you know, we do more on ecological and environmental protection. But you know, in the past, you know, we think they are separate. But now, you know, we have to have a new mindset. Instead, you know, this is the logo you know, created by the government of Hong Kong and some other government in the world. You know, but I think it is still outdated. <laughs> that means uh, they, they, you know, if you look at this logo, what's the difference of this logo with the last one? The last one, the uh, free cycle being totally separated. Now you make them closer so that you they are they are something you know, they are overlapped. So that overlapped is so called sustainability. But I don't believe that. 
<laughs> should be that. <laughs> Sustainability should be have. So we should have a more holistic work. Look on sustainability. Sustainability is your diffusing environmental protection in your every work, in your every day, every activity of your daily life. That's sustainability. That's a holistic. <laughs> right? <laughs> so environmental protection is not something totally you know, get away from social and economic environments. They are one. So if we are able to make social development more environmentally, and you know, the world would be more beautiful. Similarly, you know, if we are able to make economic goal, you know, being more green, so-called, you know, our world would be very beautiful. Because you know, on one hand, we are able to make money, and the other hand, you know, we are able to protect the environment. So remember the first slide I mentioned, you know, we have increased human population growth during the past 100 years. But you know, similarly, you know, we have an imbalance you know, in making use of natural resources. Because 95% of our natural resources you know, that are consumed in, you know, in exploring the natural resources, but only 5% of our resources are placed on you know, resuming the natural environment. Oh, we, if we are able to make that imbalance, more balance, you know, in, in fact, you know, we are able to make <laughs> environmental protection into money. That's beautiful, right? So that's all. <laughs> you know, go beyond zero, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nowadays, you know, we think about zero, zero impact. You know, when you know, a lot of people say you know, they are environmental protection. So they want to reduce, they want to make it into zero impact. But today I make you with a new idea to make sure of environmental protection more proactively to make it into money. <laughs> Have you ever think about it? Environment is money actually. Environment is natural resource, one of the natural resources, right? <laughs> If we are able to make sure of the environment, it is win-win. So sustainability, and I mean, one meaning of sustainability is holistic. The other meaning of sustainability actually is all wins. Right? Sustainability is not something you know, that stop at a point. It is moving. It is always moving ahead. That's something a bit. So, climate change, so unfortunately, my sorry. <laughs> I just copied it you know, from the Chinese uh, government's website. You know. What is climate change? I don't need to say more, but you know, in fact, you know, it is very obvious, uh, as I said, as I observed in the Arctic and Antarctic. You know. So, uh, I don't want to pay more. But what's the cause of global climate change? You know, you know, technically, you know, it relates to air pollution you know, by making you of the fossil fuel. And so I, I show you a slide about Mexico City. <laughs> you know, it consumes a, a lot of, uh, it burns oil and it burns coal. It has a very you know, cloudy population and you know, high, you know, really cold congestion every day. So you can see a lie here, right? <laughs> a small lie. It actually related to photochemical smog. The chemical smog, you know, it, it emitted by the vehicle and you know, with some chemical reaction in simple, you know, making it harmful to our health. And so because they are heat, but in fact, whenever there is a cold, cold winds coming, you know, that, you know, uh, for the chemical smog, you know, that restricted you know, to the lower level of the atmosphere. So it cover, something like you are know, covering the whole city, it makes such you know, very difficult in respiration. So something in Hong Kong, you know, now we have the air pollution index. You know, whenever there is warm weather and cold weather come, you know, it's happened, you know, with that air pollution. The other, you know, low energy consumption efficiency. 
you know, in fact, you know, yeah, electricity, it seems to be green, but the carbon footprint is really high. <laughs> Have you ever think about that? You know, now, you know, a lot of people promote electric cars. You know, it looks good, but in fact, you know, if you are you know, mechanical and electrical engineer, you know it more. You know, when the electric electricity being produced in the castle pit power station is transmitted in the town center, you know, 60% of the energy loss during the transmission process. <laughs> yeah, because you know, transmission is a way of you know, reducing your, your energy you know, in physics. You know? So now you know, we make sure of this you know, light, light bulbs you know, and other you know, you know, in environmentally saying, you know, they are of very low energy efficiency and you know, they waste a lot of energy. And more important is the improve of the living quality in the third world. You can't stop it, right? This, this is human rights. You, know. you can't say you know, only the US and the European, uh, you know, they, get, they can enjoy good living quality. Everybody have that right you know, to enjoy good living quality. So uh, now they you know, everything upon to China and the developing country. I would say it is unfair, right? <laughs> First of all, you know, most of the polluting pieces you know, in United States and Europe have been you know, removed and changed the production line into the developing country, like China and Vietnam. You know, it is so-called export of pollution, export of climate change. <laughs> but you know, on the other hand, you know, eighty percent of the product in the developing country, they would you know, be sold uh, in the market of the developed country. <laughs> but you know, so they making use of money, you know, by polluting the environment, so that they can enjoy the living quality. And in fact, you. Know, Holistically, look at the world. You know, we are in the same boat. We are in the same boat. So you know, climate change, so it affects not only the developing country, but also affecting the developed country. Mm -hmm. So look at the news today. Yesterday, actually, you know, I was reported surprisingly uh, that was slowing in Hawaii. <laughs> I never think about slow in Hawaii. I just think it is a good resort you know, for my summer. <laughs> but you know, it's global climate change. Everybody is suffering, and you know, increase in human population. But finally, consumer is suffering. Yeah, we consume you know, too much. We consume you know, more than we need. You know, I, I always give this example. You know, how many pair of sports shoes you have in your home? <laughs> Two. Two pairs? How many of you have only two pairs of sports shoes? Somebody tell me four. <laughs> but you have only two feet. <laughs> marketing is very important. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, marketing. Marketing people are more, you know, are more experienced you know, in the world. So Donald Trump is a good marketing people. <laughs> you <Why? laughs> So. He sells a lot of his idea. You know. He's a very, very good marketing person. You know, but you know, on the other hand, you know, he just look at money. He just look at you know, consumerism. So we, no, not surprising, you know, we have only two feet, but we obtain more than four to six pair of sports shoes. Because one pair of sports shoes is for our daily life. The other is for, for my uh, running my iPhone tomorrow. And the other pair is for badminton. This pair, <laughs> right? This pair is for attracting my boyfriends. <laughs> but you know, no, you're not surprising. You twenty know, percent of wealthy people consume you know, more than eighty percent of natural resources in the world. So, so the outcome is uh, increase in temperature. So from after the Second World War, from 19, 
58 uh, years that was the year I was born <laughs> from Lao. <laughs> and your increase in the uh, surface temperature of ocean. You know, a lot of us you know, omit the impact of ocean. But in fact, the global climate change, you know, the most crucial factor is ocean. Don't you believe that? In fact, 97% uh, of water resources are reserved in the ocean. And 72% of surface area of our Earth is covered by ocean. So, uh, we talk about increase in temperature in Hong Kong. In fact, Hong Kong is just a small place in the world. Uh, even though you include United States, Canada, and Europe, you know, the populated area, surface area, in the world is only 7% of the overall surface area of the Earth. You know, the other are deserts, are hills, you know, we cannot live there. You know. But ocean, ocean is important. Talk about climate. You know. Have you ever think about climate? When small <laughs> force, slow, what are they? Water. Water in different form. <laughs> right? But so ocean is important. But you know, we never think about ocean. You know, our major world is only focused on the land based activity. That's the wrong direction. And you know, more important is you know, about the, you have the world of greenhouse gas. You know. We talk about carbon dioxide always that. But in fact, uh, carbon dioxide only you know, composed of 55% of the overall global greenhouse gas. More important is methane. One molecule of methane can produce 206 times the effect of carbon dioxide. So what's the major source of methane? Cows. Yeah. You eat McDonald's. <laughs> you, know, you enjoy beef, you enjoy steaks, right? <laughs> In fact, you know, it's you know, the activity of wealthy people rather than the poverty. And you know, we talk about ocean, and uh, one which is uh, syllable ways uh, I don't want to mention more. And more important is we call the Southern Oceanization or El Nino effect you know, that affects our weather. You know, I don't want to talk more. You know, if I talk about it, it, it consumes me with another half an hour. But the fact is, you know, I, I always mention, 70% of surface area of the Earth is ocean. And always remember, 97% of global water resources is seawater. So you know, it is an area we never think about. And so that is the satellite picture. But what, what's happened you know, with the global climate change you know, ecologically? You know, this is an area you know, I you know, have in my research for more than 40 years during my life. And that's about what we call harmful algal boom or you know, in common, it is red tide. Red tide is actually one of the impacts you know, resulted from global climate change. Increase of happening. But Red tide actually happened naturally in the world during the history. But you know, the frequency of occurrence has increased significantly during the past 30 years because of warming of the sea. You know, the, the warmer of the sea, the higher temperature will stimulate the growth of the single cell algae. You know, more cell division you know, will result in the discoloration of the seawater, so-called red tide. So, Paris Convention, you know, a lot of people you know, have dream, have quick hope on that. You know, I don't want to say more. You know, I have already, give you, you know, have already given you with some of the meeting and website. You, know, you can look at the key points of you know, Paris so-called climate agreement. But the, the point is that you know, the target is that you know, in the coming 100 years, you know, we reduce the increase the increase in temperature to less than 2 degrees Celsius you know, in the coming 80 or 100 years. 
the more idealistic, you know, they would like you know, to 2050, you know, that it increases only 1.5 degrees Celsius. It looks beautiful, <laughs> idealistic. <laughs> but, you know, remember the world, increase 2 degrees Celsius. Increase 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's already an increase there. You know, even though we achieved the target, you know, of Paris Convention, that's still change you know, in our world. And although you know, that two degrees Celsius is co in comparison with the early beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so two degrees is significantly you know, is significant you know, enough you know, to change the world, you know, to change the ecosystem. So it did money. <laughs> So why Paris Convention is in a show, you know, the problem is, you know, people are debating who would be the most sponsor, who would afford you know, the money you know, in tackling global climate change, who is able to afford the money of reducing or increasing energy efficiency. And you know, if there is money, where will the money go? Right? Good questions. <laughs> so uh, according you know, to and survey by so-called World Energy Outlook, is that investment in low carbon energy technology and energy efficiency is what is in the order of 500 billion a year for the next 20 years. And will be required to meet the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the atmosphere. So <laughs> every year, you know, it will consume more than 500 billion US dollars. US dollars. So, look at the lack of design, you know, nobody can afford it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I don't want to use the word of losing money. <laughs> so that's you know, the quick key idea of the whole lecture. Go beyond zero <laughs> to make it win win. So you know, we invest money. You, know, you a lot of you are very good investor. You, know, you invest money in the stock market, right? But it not not necessarily you know, you consume your money. You, know, you have high expectation, you would get the money back. In, even you know, in so many times you <coughs> invest. <laughs> so, I, yeah. So, so look at it favorably. You know, we are only investing money. You know, so we have to look at it favorably. In future, we should have 300 or 400 percent of return. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's the idea I want to sell to you this today, actually. <laughs> oh. In fact, uh, more of the money would be invested into technology improvement. Yeah, into technology improvement and engineering work. You know, for, for example, you know, you know, in the early slides, you talk about reduction, remedy, remediation, resilience. You know, all of these works, you know, they need money. They consume money. And, but you look at it favorably. You are investing money in protecting the natural environment. But in other terms, you, know, you would have returns you know, from protecting the environment. You know, first of all, you, you save money. At least you save money, right? You, 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 you do environmental protection work, you, you will save money. You, you will save a lot of money. At least you know, in, in protecting Hong Kong, like the typhoon last year, you know, that's very destructive you know, to Hong Kong. 
know, if, if we had less typhoon in the coming year, of course, you know, we would save money. But on the other hand, you know, have you ever think about the making you of climate change into your money? <laughs> now, one way of doing this is uh, so-called carbon neutral, and that you know, we call carbon emission trading. Carbon emission trading. So, in fact, you know, for the Paris Convention, you know, it gave quick hope on the so-called carbon emission trading. So they are just thinking, you know, carbon emission trading, you know, can make you, uh, it's a very good financial tool to make money. But I don't think so. <laughs> it is one of the tools, but it is not the only tool. So nowadays, you know, they are thinking about, you know, financial tool to make money through that. So, in fact, you know, in the coming year, you know, we need a lot of money to invest into the global climate change. In, we need money urgently you know, for tackling global climate change in short. So nowadays, you know, a lot of businessmen, you know, they put their eye on environmental pieces. Environmental pieces is go beyond zero. You know, in the past, we talked about environmental protection, that's you know, would like to reduce it. But you know, we have to make use of it. So because first of all, you know, if we invest money you know, in tackling global climate change, we will reduce disaster. We will re reduce loss. And you know, corporate, we will also you know, improving our corporate image by you know, doing something, corporate social responsibility. In fact, nowadays, you know, if you want your business to be uh, to go into the stock market, that is a rule in the Hong Kong stock market. You know, every company in the stock market should produce a corporate social responsibility report every year. If that corporate social responsibility report is not accepted, you know, that the stock market would reject you, you know, to put your business into the stock market. But, <laughs> well, optimistic, you know. Think about it, you know, if you are an en energy engineer, you, know, you are able you know, to make you of new energy you know, into renewable energy, actually, it's a very <coughs> money-making business. Now, you know, we have a so-called you know, renewable energy electricity portrayal scheme you know, promoted by the government. If you in your country, in your, in your house, you, know, you install with solar panel, you know, the excessive uh, electricity produced by your solar panel, you can sell it back you know, to China Lights and Power, and China Lights and Power will give you money. That is you know, what we can do you know, as a small people small potato in the society. You know, but for businessmen and engineers, they can look it more favorably, you know, producing new energy. And cleaner production is another opportunity. Right? So we have very polluting industry in the past. So you know, we have to change our production line. Yeah. Just on time. <laughs> no worry. <laughs> you know, and in China, we call circular economy. That is uh, the recycling industry, the recycling of natural resources, and finance, you know, emission trading, carbon trading, is a money. So the uh, the SBC has a special session now. You know, they invest in money and doing research on making use of the financial tool to make global climate change into money. And you know, if you are insurance seller, you, know, you will find it interesting. You know, because in future, there would be more disaster and more risky. And you know, the more risk, you know, the higher market for the insurance people. And carbon audit <laughs> you know, is you know, for your company, your know, energy efficiency and energy improvement. And now they in fact, you know, we have eco-tourism, so-called, <laughs> going to you know, some ecological places, but you know, it has and consumables. Now we, you know, nowadays, you know, we look at you know, the improvement of our daily life, and you know, in fact, it has and consumables is a daily market. I think 
your Alex speaker will focus on that. I, I don't want to put more. But uh, in fact, you know, in future, for research and for new business and technology, would have these three major areas new energy, new material, and new environmental technology. New energy, I don't want, I don't need to say more. But in fact, you talk about energy efficiency, talk about uh, controlling, system control, we need more material. And in fact, your AI you know, is able to help. Uh, technology is not as destructive as that. You know. They are very constructive. So for example, air conditioning, you know, if we are connected to a very good you know, computer, computerized system, you know, we are able to control the air temperature you know, by intelligence. And so we are able to reduce our energy consumption and to improve our energy uh, technology. That is so-called environmental technology. And so we also need good, excellent environmental leaders. Yeah. So, uh, in that, you, know, you have a lot of good leaders in your mind. Who is your ideal leader? Now, you know, we don't need you know, this kind of politician. politician. We need more environmental leaders. I, 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 I cannot you know, give you more uh, about leadership then. But now, you know, the leadership style in the modern world is not only rely on charisma, not only on transaction. So good leader, good environmental, environmental leader in the modern world should be trans transformational leaders. We need more transformation. So changing your mind, changing your idea, that's transformational, right? So you know, these are uh, the leadership thing. I, I don't want to go more. Huh? You can look at your, your PowerPoint or Wing Kai can arrange another lecture for me on leadership. But you know, in fact, what is a good leader? You know, a good leader should you know, have this capacity you know, in management of resource, management of human, and management of change, management of climate change. Go away with this. This is interesting. If I have thought, oh, so go back to. Sustainable development. You know, the fundamental idea of sustainable development you know, come from that book, you know, so-called Bentland Report, Our Common Future. And you know, the definition of sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the person without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So the essence of sustainability, I think you know, it is a continuous process. It is a prolonged process, and you know, we should have our hearts being responsible and accountable, and equity, as I mentioned. But more important, it should be win-win. So I would say environmental deterioration is a challenge. So it is, you know, environmental sustainability to go away from government, from government to governance. That's what, what is the meaning of from government to governance? Public participation, business engagement. You know, nowadays you're talking about environmental protection. You know, if we are able to divide the society into three layers, the top level uh, should be the politicians and the government people and the general public you know, in the you know, foundation. You know, the in between the government and the general public should be the business sector. And business sector should do more. Because first, more of the pollutants are produced by the business. And secondly, businessmen are able to change our lifestyle because of the marketing scale. And business sector you know, also make our society being wealthy. So I would end here, you know, sustainability should be your know, all-win scenario. It is a, an all-win scenario. Go beyond zero. Go beyond zero. So you should win, win all.
就賣 B 零二四，碌碌驚入嚟，又過部卡利清事啊 ，solution solutions are always there， 又 look at it optimistically， 又話得定，又 look at the unfavorable side and 又 sustainability。To my view, is turning challenge into opportunity. Go beyond zero impact. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to our second section. Mm -hmm. uh, we shall move on to our second talk for today. Uh, I have great pleasure of introducing to you our second speaker. Dr. Mac Chen Wan Ning, Mrs. <laughs> uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mac Chen Wan Ning, right, <laughs> Miss. As she started her career as a teacher at uh, Queen Elizabeth School, uh, then a lecturer at Grantham College of Education in Hong Kong. She helped oversee the great process of expansion of the college to become Hong Kong Institute of Education and now uh, the Education University of Hong Kong. Uh, Mrs. Matt Chang is now the chair of Homeland Green, a non-profit organization which aims to improve soil quality and reserve this and soil uh, degradation, supporting local farmers to regenerate soil in Hong Kong, and also supporting tree planting projects in mainland China, as far, as, as far north as in Inner Mongolia, uh, which she will report to us today. With her extensive experiences in the field, so it's going to talk on this topic. Road to regeneration, the emerging who, what, when, and how beyond why. So we welcome Mrs. McChain, uh, Dr. McChain. Good morning, everybody. And um, I prepared my script to make sure that you know I can finish what I want to share with you within the time frame. Because if I don't prepare a script, then it's very easy for me, you know, to go astray, and then difficult to come back to what I prepare. So I may go slightly fast for the first part, okay? And hope my PowerPoint prepare will be able to. Uh, help clarify what I try to say. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Jung, 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 for outlining the basic scientific arguments behind the global change crisis and for mapping out the various responsibilities that corporations should shoulder and the kind of leadership that is needed in order to bring about the kind of changes that are so needed at this time. In the following 45 minutes or so, I would like to share with you what may be a slightly different perspective of how I view today's issues and the kind of movement across the group I see as a layperson, an ordinary citizen, and as a student of science. From what I read about business news, 2018, the year just passed, saw a collective effort throughout the world to not capital markets towards a longer-term perspective, it turned an important corner, bringing the interests of financial markets and broader society into closer alignment. In 2018, over 7,000 companies with, with more, uh, worth 
more than 50% of global market capitalization, and more than 750 cities, states, and regions disclosed environmental data through CBD. That is an 11% jump on the previous year. This never happened before, as considering ESG, that means environmental, social, and governance issues, in investment decisions has historically been portrayed as synonymous with sacrificing financial return. But this view is now considered as an out-of-date understanding. It seems that more business now understand that markets and society can mutually benefit from the creation of shared value when capital can be allocated to a solution that both meet an environmental or social need and generate financial returns. There may be different reasons behind this change of mindset. For one, of course, we must thank the scientists, people like Professor Jung, Ho, Ho, who become more and more vocal about the findings and the widespread warning of the disastrous consequence about inaction to climate change. Now, people on the street attribute almost everything they don't like about the weather of the day to climate change. And more investors are now making it clear that they want the assets protected by corporate boards that incorporate consideration of climate change into their decision making. We know that money drives the world around, and corporations need their investors. Investor pressure is as much a driver on addressing climate change as policy and technological innovation. So the timely completion of the set of 11 industry-specific sustainability accounting standards issued by SASB in 2018 came right on time to provide a tool for responsible and transformational leaders of cooperation to communicate more effectively with these growing number of investors. We even saw the dawn of 2019, exactly, it is on the 24th of January, marked by the coming together of MUXC, PNG, WBCSD, if you are the business people, you know who they are, ING and CISL, to debate on the how of transition from a linear to a circular economy. I have the honor of taking part in that webinar and very much benefit from it. What's going to be very interesting is the coming together of the number of investor heavyweights and third party agencies at the responsible business summit to be held on the 18th and 19th of March in New York. The heavyweights include leaders of JP Morgan, Rebecca Sam, State Street Global Advisors, Sustainanatics, Sears, Goldman Sachs, MSCI, BNP, CECP, UBS, Moody's, Bank of America, you name it. They're there. They'll be there. The opening keynote will be delivered by Liz Kingo, who is the CEO and Executive Director of UN Global Compact, where she will be speaking on the importance of meeting the SDGs. Such coming together for such a purpose is totally unthinkable a few years ago. Does it mean that main money makers in the world are awakening to the call for responsibility? Or they now come to the realization that sustainability value proposition has become a tool for achieving competitive advantage? or that big corporations now have the balance between reputational and commercial benefits? After all, as estimated by OECD, better managing risks and opportunities related to climate change and transitioning to a low carbon economy can represent an enormous economic opportunity, estimated by some to be as high as 26 trillion by 2030, whereas the global cost of inaction on climate change can be as high as 
69 trillion. Whatever the incentives, I think we all welcome this change. At least this is the right direction. But how about the pace? Will that really move the world beyond zero impact in time? I would like to share with you my humble thought, which I learned from Bill Reed, one of the regenerative architects and landscape designers I admire. Let me begin by differentiating between two words, sustainability and regenerative. As the word sustainable often gets thrown around frequently these days, with very little regulation or definition to back it up, please allow me to use the following to clarify what I'm trying to say. Okay, so sustainability may mean the ability of a system to be maintained at a certain rate of level, avoiding depletion of natural resources so that the system itself remains ecologically balanced within this context, okay? So I would take this as my understanding of the word sustainability. Whereas, for regenerative, it means the ability of a system to benefit its context or ecology. It is healing or creating something better than where it was started. Okay, so this is the idea of regeneration. So here is the Reed's model. If you look at the two ideas on a spectrum, nature as a regenerative system is a plus one. It doesn't need additional energy other than the sun. And as long as the sun is still there, nature will regenerate itself irrespective of the existence of human beings. So if humans do things to nature to assist in the evolution of subsystems, or if humans participate as nature in the co-evolution of the whole system, we will be part of the regenerative system, and that is a plus one. Co-evolving means that we are creating a positive influence on ecology and then sustainable by definition would be a zero because it is not negatively impacting or positively impacting but is at a steady maintainable level. Now if we follow this path what we find here at negative one will be our present local, national, or even international codes and convention. Essentially, these codes are in place to keep us safe only. They are at the best, at the very best, not illegal. And despite the changes over millennia of the way human beings lived and are living, the fundamental needs of most of us have never changed. Clean air, clean water, adequate nutrition, shelter, safety, community, certain sense of comfort, freedom, equity, dignity, and hope. If global issues are threatening our civilization or survival, it means that the present codes are not sufficient to make sure that our fundamental survival needs can be satisfied. And so even if the Paris Agreement on Emission Reduction is enforced by every nation within the time frame, that can only be considered as relative improvement. The most of the so-called green campaign, less waste, less energy, less plastic, etc., a lot of less. In other words, less bad, but still bad. We can only come to zero impact neutral, which means only 100% less bad, but it's still not positive. As I take the theme of this series of seminars beyond zero impact to mean 
moving beyond the line of zero. We need restorative and regenerative measures. In this connection, oh, sorry. The Rockstrom report published in Nature September 2009 may give us a clearer picture of the reality of our real frontiers. And I think this summarizing diagram is self-explanatory. The green zone gives us some idea of the ecological boundaries before a total breakdown. You can see that even though climate change manages to capture most people's attention, what really has gone far beyond the boundaries are biodiversity loss. And then nitrogen and phosphorus, disturbance of nitrogen and phosphorus cycling in our biosphere. And of course, there are ocean acidification, and there are global freshwater use. There are change in land use, and then also the atmospheric aerosol loading, which cannot be quantified. It doesn't mean that they haven't gone, through, gone beyond the boundary. It's just that technologies and science haven't got the data to help us to quantify. And then also the chemical pollution they are not yet quantified, but we have seen it everywhere. They are polluting not only the land, they are polluting our health. They are damaging our health. Published recently in the Journal of Biological Conservation as the first global scientific review of the research team on biodiversity led by Professor Paul Ethlich at Standard University warned that Insects could go extinct within a century, with cat catastrophic consequences for life on Earth. A third of insects are already endangered species, and they are going to extinct at the rate eight times that of birds, mammals, and reptiles, the latter of which has been reported as having one known species going extinct every 20 minutes by an earlier report. Paul told reporter of the Guardian Weekly, in 10 years' time, you will have a quarter less. In 50 years' time, half left. In 100 years, you will have none. The chief drivers of the decline of biodiversity loss is in order of magnitude. First, habitat loss caused by intensive agriculture and urbanization. Second, pollution caused mainly by pesticides and fertilizers. Third, diseases and competition with newly introduced species. Fourth, climate change, particularly in the tropics. Of course, children growing up in Hong Kong who would instantaneously grab any insecticide spray available at the site of any chong chong would find it no big deal. Is it? The major drivers behind the disturbance, the natural nitrogen, this is the word, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycle, of course, are also chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and they run off. This is an issue seldom cared by people who think that they can always get the food from supermarkets and never need to ask how are they produced. To our consolation across the group, there are impressive projects, of course. For example, Paul Hawken, author, entrepreneur, and environmentalist, gathers and facilitates a broad coalition of researchers, scientists, graduate students, PhDs, postdocs, policymakers, business leaders, and activists to assemble and present the best available information on climate solutions in order to describe their beneficial financial, social, and environment impact over the next 30 years. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Hawkins' project work. This is a momentous one. Over the 30 years, 
They ran the solutions in order and got the report published in 2014, entitled Drawdown. What was uncovered is a path forward that can roll back global greenhouse gas emissions within 30 years. The research revealed that humanity has a means and techniques at hand. Nothing new needs to be invented. Humanity's task is to accelerate the knowledge and growth of what is possible as soon as possible. But then the next question is, who is going to take up the tasks? Still on another note, most people know that on December 12, 2015, 197 countries reached an international agreement to address global warming. But the Paris Climate Accord was not the only history-making moment during the 2015 Paris Climate Summit. This part is never covered in any press in Hong Kong. On December 1st, the French government launched a 4 per thousand Soils for Food Security and Climate Initiative. It is a bold plan proposing that if adopted and implemented on a large scale by the countries that have signed on to the Paris Climate Deal, has a power to cool the planet and feed the world. We don't need GMO. We don't need chemical fertilizers. In simplest terms, the four per thousand ini initiatives call for countries to draw down more carbon than they emit and to store it in the soil. How? By scaling up regenerative farming, grazing, and land use practices. These practices lead to an increase in photosynthesis, nature's own system for pulling excess carbon out of the air and sequestering it in the soil. They also produce more drought resistant and resilient crops and more nutrient dense food. As its name suggests, the fall per thousand addresses both global warming and food security. Soil degradation now threatens at least a third of the Earth's land surface, and climate change is accelerating the rate of, de de of degradation. And then just a couple of weeks ago, the World Economic Forum seemed to echo the French initiative and published a report after the annual meeting which calls on to the present wasteful way of linear food production system to be transitioned to a circular economy for food. The chair lady told reporters today, for every dollar spent on food, society pays two dollars in health, environmental and economic costs. And why is our present food production system wasteful and damaging? because we're extracting finite resources, degrading arable land, causing air pollution, antibiotic resistance, water contamination, and pesticide exposure from food production as mi and mismanaged byproducts could claim twice as many lives as a current toll from obesity. I wonder whether it is now Hong Kong people begin to take a closer look at what is offered in our supermarkets and restaurants and the dining tables of our kids that begin to ask the question how our food is grown. The wasteful way we produce food today which refine its resources including phosphorus, potassium and soil to grow food in ways that harm the natural systems upon which agriculture depends. Damage includes the degradation of 12 million hectares of arable land a year, a quarter of annual green gas emissions, and almost three quarters of deforestation. Air pollution antibiotics, resistance, water contamination, and pesticide exposure from food production is mismanaged by products could claim twice as many lives as the current from obesity. And it is a circular economy for food. Food waste is designed out, food by products are used at the highest value 
and food production generates rather than the great natural system. This is what we need. But the nature of most of these good will initiatives and pews, which Reed would call works on arresting disorder, have something in common. To different degrees, most just try to minimize impact, solve discrete problems, restore to something back in time, or prevent the emergence of further damage. But is that enough to move us beyond the line? When we look at the list of global issues, we may have our own focus and tend to concentrate our attention on individual issues. We may talk about climate change, loss of biodiversity, air and water pollution, toxicants in the environment, raw material degradation, poverty, social injustice or justice, climate and economic immigrants, food safety, desertification and land degradation, food security, the chronic disease epidemic, and human health. And what about fresh water supply? Are they individual issues or are they connected? People with holistic mind of thinking could see relationships, not just things. Our natural system is regenerative because it always enables greater potential. It is interesting to note that the French initiative attracts best attention not from national leaders, not from the press, nor from big agribusiness, nor corporations, but from grassroots individuals. In the following, I'm going to share with you some of the grassroots, participatory, citizen-driven, socio-ecological, restorative and regenerative movement I have the privilege to come across in the past several years, which give me hope, as they are really making positive impact on the environment the place, the people, the community, and the economy. In June 2015, about 60 people from 21 nations with background in business, farming, and scientific communities, education institutions, policies of most NGOs, convened in Costa Rica to draw a blueprint for international movement united around a common goal. That is, to reverse global warming and end world hunger by facilitating and accelerating the global transition to regenerative agriculture and land management. In three years' time, Regeneration International managed to engage with a network of more than 250 international partners, my homeland green being one of them, my very, very humble, small, NGO in Hong Kong, and a growing number of regenerative alliances throughout the world, including in the US, South Africa, India, Canada, Belize, Mexico, and Guatemala. The vision is to create a healthy global ecosystem in which practitioners of regenerative agriculture and land use, in concert with consumers, educators, business leaders, and policymakers, Cool the planet, feed the world, and restore public health, prosperity, and peace on a global scale. I came across the work through my recent studies on regenerative farming and got myself involved when I attended the first Living Soil Symposium in Montreal in October 2017. The event was organized by a grassroots grassroot group comprising four young ladies in their late 20s and early 30s. These, young four, these four young people managed to invite almost all of the relevant scientific leaders across the group on the subject, and managed to attract some 300 participants from all over the world. You know what? 
It's for young ladies when they organize a conference. They make sure that it is carbon neutral. How? We pay the fee. I travel from Hong Kong to Canada, OK? So they count all the mileage. Counting all the mileage and traveling that have our cost on uh, carbon dioxide emission. So they donate the same amount of money for reforestation and supporting farmers to change into regenerative. That is why I'm quite surprised and I feel slightly uncomfortable, you know, when we have only a gathering of less than 10 persons that we have to enjoy such coziness with air conditioning and lighting. I've got used to sharing and giving lectures and whatever talks and workshops in open air because we have to walk our talk. And I'm deeply impressed by these young ladies because they walk their talk. Even they have to host such a big international event. They give consideration to every detail to make sure that they walk their talk. After that, the NGO Regeneration Canada was established as a result. Here are some of the works of regeneration of in, uh, international in different parts of the world. You can see here, this is a lady from India. OK, so all these are all the videos produced on the documentary of all the regenerative farming efforts in all over the world with a young lady in India who says all the farmers in the world can contribute to mitigate climate change. And then everything we do is based on soil organic carbon. This is what makes regenerative farming different from an ordinary organic farming. The soil is a bank, it is a fertility and it is a source needed to address climate change through the way we manage our soil. And that is from India, and this is from Brazil. We can prevent forced economic migration from our countryside. Because if the farmers can make use of land, regenerate it, grow their own food, grow their economy, they can meet their needs, and they don't need to migrate. And then for those in Mexico, thanks to planned holistic grazing, I don't know whether you are familiar with this word, because uh, Professor Ho just mentioned about the uh, problem of methane. But again, that is an outdated concept. If you are familiar with the work of Savory, uh, of Alan Savory, who started his um, Savory Institute maybe 20 years ago, when in regenerative farming we are practicing rotational grazing, where the methane problem can be resolved. And then by rotational grazing, it helps regenerate the land. And that is why this Mexico farmer will say, thanks to plant holistic grazing, we have increased soil organic matter. And it allows us to hold an additional 250,000 liters of water per hectare. They solve the drought problem. And then they now know that livestock are a great part of our lives. And then, so for us, livestock and land cannot be separated. And then this lady from Mexico said that, I've learned that the best ally of the soil is a plant. This is the farmer from France who, tell, who wants to tell the world that the fertility rate of our garden soils are 26 times higher than the objectives of, a per, of the 4 per thousand initiative. And they want to show the world that it is possible to produce quality food. And then this is here farmers working in Van Gogh region. They address deforested areas to plant mangroves 
and which provides the village with twice as much seafood, while rebuilding soil and generating profits is proving that regenerating soil and rebuilding soils and regenerating profits are viable. Of course, farmers who also say that policy must be such that even consumers support the entire initiative. Every dollar counts. And then when I do my lectures and workshops and shows, I always ask, from where do you buy your food? For every dollar we spend on food production that is damaging to the economic system, we are supporting the ruin of our planet. For every dollar you spend on supporting farmers who work with the land and regenerate the soil, and provide quality food, we are helping to regenerate our planet. Every dollar count. Vote with our cent, our every cent. Being ecologically conscious and economically viable are not two opposing forces, but they can work hand in hand. This is the French farmer I visited after the Regeneration Canada uh, operation. What he, what he tried to convey is that an active soil is a living soil where there is a wide range of life. Seldom, people seldom know that there are much more biodiversity in the soil, six feet under, six inches under our feet lot more di biodiversity than anything we see above the soil, above the land. What we need is a more understanding of our world. And then For those of you who are interested, here's a summary of what is regenerative and in what way it is different from the so-called organic farming. But I won't go into details of that, okay? And then I had the opportunity to witness how the regenerative power of nature unfolds itself in a water retention project of a temporal com community in Portugal when human beings managed to make the right decision. This temporal community in Portugal is a small piece of land with a fairly fragile hydrological cycle threatened by desertification. Upon the, this is what was happening, okay, and this is what has become of this landscape. Upon the advice of an expert hydrologist and a team of ecologists, the community works as a whole to create a water retention, that is the beginning of the work, to create a water retention landscape within six years, they're mitigating and adapting to climate change, ensuring they're trapping the rainwater, and so that what was like this before became something like that. Restoring the ecology and protect the biodiversity ensuring that the landscape is much more resilient. And then they try out and ensure that they have food security and experimenting with renewable energy. They're using, they're, 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 they're experimenting with uh, biogas, you know, from the vegetation. And then they, they, the community share all the food in the community hall and which are all grown throughout the region. And they Recycle all the biological waste. Well, sorry, I forgot that this is not the. I used to use a laser pointer. Sorry. They turn everything biological back into compost, and so that all these things go back to land, to soil. 
and then they um, are building a respective and healthy, healthy community for the children and future generation. And then they are building houses which are ecological. Okay, so it's not only reducing emission. You don't need any extra energy rather than the sun. Some members of the community even work as peace workers in the Middle East as they anticipate that the next war there will be about water resources. And these experiences and contacts led me to Via Organica in San Miguel, the Alanda in Mexico, which is a socio-ecological and economical regenerative project initiated by Ronnie Cummings, the originator and CEO of the Organic Consumers Assum Association with two million membership in the States. Ronnie Cummings came to Mexico City 10 years ago because he wanted the Organic Consumer Association to go international and came to set up an office in this Mexican town. He chose Mexico because there is a large tradition of organic farming in Mexico with 210,000 certified organic farmers. But most of the organic food in this country is exported to the States. While local feed on junk food, he started a restaurant, this is it, and began to meet some of the local producers for organic food sauce. Then he realized that he needed a grocery store to run the restaurant so that there is no waste. Later, he found that the people want beer and wine and there was no organic bear in Mexico. So he bought some brewing equipment, set up and learned from a master brewer, and started producing their own bear. Later he found that he needed to teach more farmers how to build up soil to produce real pest-free nutrient food, and so started a farm 10 miles outside the town for practice and farming. The system built over the years, and now they have 70 employees together, with thousands of customers coming in on a regular basis, including tourists from the States as well as local residents to enjoy the food they buy from 248 small producers spread around the town. They then came up with the idea of closing down the streets outside the store occasionally and have a full-grown farmer's market for people who cannot go inside the restaurant. And then, in order to reach out to more organic farmers who have no access to internet or TV, they started to run a radio program 45 minutes every day to offer more teaching and became the biggest radio station in the region. Besides regenerative farming, they also began teaching young people that the way their grandparents built their houses, which are actually the best building for the region, which are cool in summer and warm in winter. They're beautiful and expensive, and as most farmers in Mexico don't have wells, and are thus hampered by the amount of food they can grow and the animals they can raise, which are all free range. They introduced back into those here, okay? Those adobe houses of roof tiles, which can get used as ring gatherers. So the Via Organic Hub has become a full-grown food system, which becomes an example of what could be the norm, not only in Mexico, but also in America. And it is spreading. It was difficult for a project at the beginning to break even, and Cummings had to solicit, at the beginning, donations from his two million organic consumer members in the state. But now the project has become so self-sustaining and the major donors from the States are very excited about what they saw, and they want the idea to, to be spread across the state. Now there is a growing understanding among Mexican people that eating a plant-based locally produced diet with meat from animals raised in free range is a good way to go. It's changing Mexico's consumer's habit, as Mexico has a tremendous problem just like U.S. Obesity, diabetes, chronic disease has a jump onto the junk food trend over the past several decades, very much like Hong Kong. More people now come to realize that it is worthwhile paying producers a good price who are producing food and products the right way. The original restaurant has become so successful that Lonely Planet voted it several years ago number one restaurant in San Miguel 
and number 12 in Mexico. Cummings is particularly happy to see that some Mexicans who took dangerous trips to US doing all kinds of manual labor now come back as they can help build a home community and make a decent living. Cummings has developed a business model to prove that regenerative farming is economically viable. Four replicas in different parts of Mexico have built up and are now running restorative training camp for Mexican people as well as people from all over the world to come and learn. Again, all these res restoration camps are carbon neutral. When I throw my weight there, then again to calculate my mileage. And I have to work in a farm okay, for over three weeks in order to compensate all the carbon I have emitted because of my trip. In a sense, for the past 10 years or so, I never take on any trip for leisure. I only go for conferences and doing restoration work. What I learned from these people's stories is that to move beyond the zero line from conventional practices to regenerative practices, a whole new mindset is needed. We recall a chain from an elemental mind who sees issues and things as discrete elements to a holistic mind who sees connections between issues and things. It takes also the courage to rethink our place as human beings. Okay. For several times, it was mentioned that human beings were created by God to look after the planet and to manage all the living things and the system on Earth. I just wonder, is it because of that? that we always have this egocentric point of view that we are the master of all the other living? Or are we only part of it? And then, the courage to rethink. Is it corporation leaders or individuals? Where does the responsibility lie? And then, eventually, what is the desired outcome of our economic system? Can our economy be built upon the exploitation of limited resources from a finite planet? Really support a financial system fueled by the unlimited desire and greed of human beings? Or should we turn around and figure out how our financial system should work to support an economy which may continuously enhance the health of a planet and its inhabitants? I learned that even a retiree like me, who lives on pension, can still use my very limited financial resource to play a very small part in the economy with its regenerated. I sponsor a young lady to attend the Living Soils Symposium and so that he get exposed to all these master talks about, you know, global binding change, land degradation, and etc. etc. Learn from the master. I sponsor another young lady to attend the Acres USA. And then the Bionutrient Association conferences and so on, and making connection worldwide with these in regenerative movement. And then several years ago, I also sponsored three young people go to Australia and learn from my partner and friend in Lismore, where they learn about composting, composting work, doing a compost tea, and then learn how to monitor all this process under a microscope. By the way, they're all social science and humanities trained. But there's no problem for them. And then when they come back, we started a school project in Taipo, where the students are introduced to the importance of soils in a very scientific manner. They reap their harvest without adding any fertilizer or pest control. No need for that if you understand how nature works. And then my friend Chris Ellery, when I brought my students to, came to Hong Kong, given free lectures and workshops to all my farming friends and environmental friend, friends who are interested in environment, to protection, regeneration, and so on. We form international alliances that way. It's not win-win. It's not even win-win. And then I give lectures to, no, workshops 
And you may notice that all my workshops are open door. And then we have community building, and then my young participants in the conferences, they, there are several generation gap between me and those kids. And so they run stores and promoting this idea of, you know, soil microbes, everything, and so on. And then I run a composting site in Changsui near my residence, where now I have recycling materials from several markets and food production. Okay, and then we use all these. And it's so enlightening that the UN just declared that they are going to create a new food initiative named 2020 Year of Plant Health. And for any one of you who has any doubt about, any doubt about the ability to produce nutrient pest free crops, I would like to introduce you to John Kemp of AEA, who will give you all the science behind and his practices for over 10 years, who helped so many big farms in the state to regenerate their soil and so that they become pest-free, fertilizer-free, and nutrient-dense. There are various sorts of, of measurements okay, to test for our food, not only for safety, but for nutrients. So all this, we find that from moving from a conventional to a regenerative system, we have to look at how living systems are designed. And we start, we have to restart thinking about what, what life itself is. For me, it's a whole evolving system. There are elements in it, but which are all interconnected. And there must be a purpose. There are patterns and purpose, and the science tells us the pattern, but the purpose never change. Life sustains itself, and it evolves. It evolves. Who gives us the right to decide how nature works? We can try to understand a small part of it only. Being a student of science, I'm interested in biology, physics, and whatnot, okay? That little thing over there, if you're familiar with microorganisms, there are the single cell microorganisms, okay? It can be so beautiful under a microscope. And I don't know how many people, not in this room, no, stop. There are more microbiology, microorganisms in our, in our body than the number of cells in our body. In any teaspoon, in any teaspoon of soil, there are more microorganisms than all the human beings ever live on the planet. This is science. We are all connected. What is our role and purpose of sustaining life? We inhabit the earth, or are we occupying it? From living lightly on to living fully with the land, we cannot care about the pieces only can't care for just my part. We purpose our role as human. Build a mind that can see life's development and our role in it. Places are unique living organisms with purpose and vocation and have a distinctiveness or essence that identifies them. Places are to be experienced but not exploited. And over the world, there are stories of socio-ecological system restoration of generation that hold evolution potential if we care to listen and see. You know, this is where my humble journey started about 10 years ago. I just met this lady, already in her 60s, who started this first plantation project in Kulanchi, turning it in 2003 into a ecologically viable land and where the farmers can rebuild, can regrow their plants. This is another project near the Yellow River in Dunkau, and this is the Ulan Pool. I made a documentary on that and I find that for all the sandstorms in Beijing, Basically, they came from this area. That is a major source. In 
Um, and then we have a plantation site there. We visit a farm who have to desert their houses because of this sand storm. And then uh, a visitor site was started 60 years ago, and it took 60 years in the past to regenerate a small piece of land through, you know, checker, glass checkerboard, and then drip line, and then eventually turning back into an ecologically viable place. All right? I'll finish within two minutes. But now, new technology help. With the help of new technology, it only takes less than 10 years. And then, because of all this, I want young people in Hong Kong to get exposed and get this kind of experience of a place regen regenerating. So beginning to 2003, uh, we started bringing young, young people to one of the plantation sites. And these are some of their uh, and can you see the young faces? I mean, in them I see hope. Uh, behind that, behind that is one small part of that million acres of reforested land. And so, for the young people, they know that you know that small saving you plant today can turn out to be a forest. And we will benefit the future generation and more to come. And then uh, this year, the Kubuchi uh, Foundation, which started regenerating Kubuchi Desert. You know, when we talk about desert, actually all these are not natural deserts. Okay? They are all desertified land. So, no. Uh, some people would challenge me, oh, you're going to plant trees in the desert, you know, you're disturbing the ecology. We're not doing that. We will only restore the certified land, okay, turning them. And all these thousands of years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 500 years ago, are all fertile land. And the Yellow River Plateau, the uh, Lewis, the Lewis Plateau, is where it's a cradle of our Chinese civilization. It has turned desert. But then, beginning 1995, the government, with the help of the World Bank, have, a re have the biggest for reforestation in the world. And then in eight years' time, if you visit the same place, you will recognize it as a desert. It's somewhere like Sichuan. You know, with all beautiful mountains, streams, brooks, everything. And of course, the livelihood of all the inhabitants there have been improved. So this is a story. This, Kula, this Kubuchi is going to uh, launch an award for young people in Hong Kong for them to come up with entrepreneur uh, uh, idea to help Again, heal a small piece of wound in this part of the world. This is what I want to share. Uh, it's an enlightening experience for me, and it's a humbling experience for me, because I work in the education sector for over 40 years. Believed I was doing the right thing. And it turned out, it may not be the wrong thing, but definitely, it's just not that bad, but never good enough. Thank you for your patience.